This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Aloha. Uh, my name is Roger Jelinek. I'm the host of Book Wealth on Think Tech Hawaii. And my guest today is Mike Malahan, uh, the author of the novel uh, Picture Bride, uh, which tells the epic story of the Japanese in Hawaii. Uh, welcome to the program, Mike. Oh, thank you, Roger. Glad and, to be here. And uh, uh, let's start by uh, telling us where you come from. Uh, you're, you're, you live in two states, at least. Right. Um, I live in uh, Georgia part of the year. I used to live in Florida. And uh, I'm the little boy that never grew up. I've always was a Braves fan since 1953 in Milwaukee. And they moved to Atlanta. And I always said, someday, I'm going to go to all the games. And my wife says, you know, Mike, you're running out of some days. <laughs> so we moved uh, in our apartment right next to the baseball stadium. So I float between there and Hawaii. Uh, so, uh, but before you moved to Florida and Atlanta, uh, you had a really interesting career. Yes. Uh, start with where you went, where you were brought up, and uh, then when you went to the Peace Corps. You know. Yeah, well, well, thank you. I was born in Wisconsin, where you play baseball yeah. during this uh, summer and hockey in the winter. Uh -huh. And when I was a kid, my family moved to Florida, so I became a Gator, if you will, University of Florida, Gainesville. And it was during the Kennedy years, and I heard the call when he talked about the Peace Corps, and I said, that's for me. And so I spent three years in Nigeria. Do you remember reading a couple of years ago where those girls were kidnapped? Yes. Well, yeah. That's where I was. Wow. And in those days, you couldn't imagine something like that could happen. Yeah. I was one of four white people that lived in a town of 150,000 black people, never locked my door. My motorcycle was never compromised. I could walk up and have a beer at the local pub. It was a great place to, to be for a young person, a little idealistic at the time. What were you doing there? I was very lucky. I had a real job. I was with the Ford Foundation and the Ministry of Trade and Industry, the Nigerian Trade and Industry, and they had a small loan scheme. And for, you know, to, I think it was like $15,000 or less, and I would go out and visit small businesses, look at their loan applications, and, you know, give my uh, appraisal and so forth. So I was a you know a small loan so officer. So were you, were you a, a business major in college? Before I was. That? I was yeah. one of the few Peace Corps volunteers that actually had a Do job something. associated <laughs> with my career. Yeah. And so I was very lucky. And I had a job with structure. So I was very lucky to, and to do that. And uh, were you able to do that with English, or did you have to learn uh, well, local I spoke, language? Well, I, had to, I spoke Hausa, but only enough to order beer, water, and maybe <laughs> find out where I was. So I had, uh, seriously, I'd have an interpreter. You know, English was the official language of Nigeria because of the British uh, heritage. And then they had the tribal languages. So I learned to speak one of the tribal languages for small talk. Uh, well, when I was in college, my the college master had been a, a, an official in Nigeria. Oh, okay. And, and he said that the local name for the jail was the King George V Hotel. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I can... Uh, See, anyway, right. so, so you spent three years there? Three years there, and yeah. that got me a taste for um, overseas travel. Uh -huh. And I didn't realize it at the time. I remember talking to Brits there yeah. that had been overseas for years. And I said, well, how can you live like that overseas, never go back? Mm -hmm. And 40 years of my life, I've spent outside the continental United States. Uh -huh. And um, when I got back from the Peace Corps, I lived in the Caribbean. Got British, you know, I used to travel to Jamaica and all those places. What were lived, you doing in the Caribbean? I had a overseas manufacturers representative. I represented different companies as their manufacturers or rep, and I would travel all the different islands. and did that for seven years. Wow. And a good friend of mine was knocking them out uh, the home run, as you might say, in, in Japan, and he was doing so well, I said, you know, if you've got a place for somebody to carry your bag, let me know. And so in 1978, I moved to Japan, not realizing how that was going to affect uh, my life. And how did it affect your life? Well, I <clears throat> lived in Asia for over 20 years. I mean, really live. I still go back and forth, uh, you know, a month or two of the year. Uh, but I worked with a company uh, that had a license with the Walt Disney Company uh -huh. called Disney's World of English. And I had been in direct sales most of my life, Encyclopedia Britannica, you remember them. Yeah. And uh, so we used the same type of technique where people get leads, the salesmen are in commission. And at one time, uh, when I was CEO, we were the second largest licensee in Asia except for Tokyo Disneyland. So we had a pretty big operation, yeah. 2,000 salespeople, wow. Japan, Taiwan, Hong Kong. So it was a very exciting time of my life. But in the back of my mind, 
I always thought I was a writer. But you know, you work with a lot of writers. No. How many <coughs> millionaire writers do you know? You know, yeah. Tom Clancy, of course, he's dead. But, you know, you can name a few of them. Yeah. Uh, so I realized that going into writing full time was not a financially secure. And so I did all right in business. I was pretty good at it. But in my heart, I was a writer. Well, so. I first met you at the Maui Writers Conference. That's right. Yeah, no, and, and uh, you actually made yourself learn to write. I and, did. And you had a, uh, I don't think I've met anyone who was so assiduous about doing just that and so methodical about it. Yes. Uh, well, I remember, I think I attended six or seven years consecutively the Maui's Writers Conference. Yes. I met you the second year. Yeah. The first year I tried to learn, you know, what's this stuff about writing a book? And I had a book in sales management because that's what I did. Right, right. And that was relatively easy, easier than a novel because in a way I've been writing that book all my life. Yeah. But still it was a different set of skills. Yeah. And, um, and you know, you got me a deal with McGraw-Hill. Yeah. You and I are still getting royalties. Yeah. Can't believe it, 15 years later. Not enough to, you know, but, buy a new house, but still. How do you jump from that into fiction? Well, yeah. like I said, in my heart, I've always was a, you know, like most writers, your readers first, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I wanted to write a story. And um, I wrote a couple, what we call a starter novel, as your wife once so uh, very kindly says, well, Mike, now you've got your starter novel out of the way. <laughs> but I went to a movie presentation, a documentary presentation called The First Battle. It was about why the Japanese in Hawaii didn't go into the camps. I says, wow, that's, that's interesting that there's a novel in there. And then I learned more about the 442, the legendary guys that fought. I said, boy, that's a story. Lots of nonfiction book, but there's no novel. Well, why not me? And by this time, you were settled in Hawaii part-time? Yeah, I was living in Hawaii for <coughs> four, six months of the year. Yeah. And, of course, I got caught up into the Hawaiian 442. I had right. friends. My wife is Japanese, right. so that <coughs> kind of got me into the Japanese. And if you're here, you get Japanese friends, and you, you met people who... Actually, some of them were in the 442. Some of them have passed away. One of them became my surrogate father, so close to me. And so it changed my, enriched my life. So I started writing a book about the 442. And then I was thinking, these guys, they didn't just drop out of the sky December 7th, 1941. They must have had a backstory. So I thought I'd write a little something about their parents. So I said, wow, this is really interesting. And it got so big, I realized I had two books. So Picture Bride starts in a little island off of Kyushu called Amakusa, and it ends in Hawaii the night before Pearl Harbor. None of the people in the book know there's going to be Pearl Harbor. Of course, all the readers do. And book two, which I'm working on now, call it the war book or a question of loyalty, is, uh, starts with Pearl Harbor and ends up with the Italian uh, campaign. Oh, wow. Well, on the first book, how far back do you go? I go back to 1905, uh -huh. and uh, it, the first chapter actually gives why, a... Why 1905? Uh, because I wanted the girl to be young enough to be a pitcher bride. And the, there were 21,000 pitcher brides. Uh -huh. It stopped in 1924. Maybe you should explain what a pitcher bride is. Oh, Maybe yeah, that's know. a good thing. What is a pitcher bride? <laughs> a pitcher bride, you know, in the beginning, uh -huh. the Japanese men came over here for work five years, get a lot of money, go back home. It didn't work out. And then on the weekends, they would gamble, drink, men do. And you had a Catholic, I mean, a Christian, a Christian priest and a Buddhist priest came over here about the same time. And they looked at these guys running around and said, they need to be civilized. We need to get them some wives. And so they would go back and go to the homes of these hometowns. And with an omiyai, which is like a, 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 um, a person who arranges marriage, or people in the family, another you know, church, and the girls would send in a picture. And the guy would write back with his picture. And from that correspondence, maybe just one or two letters, they would exchange pictures and they would get married. The girl would go through a marriage ceremony in Japan and register the marriage to be technically legal. Somebody would stand in for the husband. She'd get over here off the boat, walk around the immigration with a picture. And then they would get a Christian marriage locally. The funny part is, once in a while, the girl wasn't the best-looking one, if you catch the drift, and she gave a picture of her good-looking girlfriend. Of course, some of the guys did that, too. And every <laughs> once in a while, after everybody is batched up, there'd be one or two people wandering around, each of them <laughs> with a bogus picture. And you know, if the girl saw this guy that was, you know, she's 19 years old, he's 44, his teeth are falling out, 
skinny, doesn't look like the successful person, she's got 90 seconds to make up her mind to get back on the ship or marry the guy. Most of them married. Wow. And did most, they, some of them literally went back? Few went back. Right. Most wow. did not. Yeah. Most did because they really couldn't go back. The only ones that had to go back is if you had pink eye or some type of a thing. They had to go through uh, a health inspection. In the beginning, it was very odious. The girls were forced to strip very, um, very odious. And eventually, they eliminated uh, that so back, part of it. So back to your story. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, so we have a picture bride who yes. comes to Hawaii. Yes. Yeah. And, and what, what happened to her then? Well, let me go back. The book is really a hint through the eyes of this 12-year-old to 17-year-old girl, what's happening in Japan. And we can see this is going to have a very bad ending. We see the militarization. You have two governments in Japan. You've got they this had just won a war against uh, Russia. Russia. Yes. They again yeah. Russia. They had beaten the Chinese. <laughs> they fought on the Allied side in World War I. But all this here, the military is getting stronger and stronger. The Japanese constitution at the time had the military reporting directly to the emperor and everybody else to the civilian. The, a strong emperor dies, you, now you have a weak emperor. So the military begins a government by itself. And you see this through the eyes of this girl. She doesn't know what she's seeing. But we as a reader can say, oh my God. And they, this, this recitation that they recite, like we do the Pledge of Allegiance, this loyalty pledge to the emperor, it's very scary. It really goes into the details that I'll do anything for the fort. So you can see, no wonder we had a war. Wow. And then you had the 1924 immigration. You know, right now we have a lot of upsetness about people immigration. Well, 1924, the problem was Jewish people and Italians flooding America. So they wanted to have a law to cut it down. And then the people on the West Coast says, you think you've got a problem with Italians and Jewish people? What is tell you about our problem? It was Japanese. So they stopped all Japanese immigration. And in Japan, in Tokyo, 1924, Yamiri Shinbun says, America declares war on Japan. So, of course, it wasn't a literal war. Right. But <clears throat> after that, the army could say, listen, we've tried dip diplomacy to treat, so Japan can be treated as equal, and this is what we get. What was the Japanese attitude to their immigrants, to their people who had left Japan? They were very protective. They, they promoted the immigration. That's really interesting. Yeah. Because they needed the foreign exchange. And it was a poor country. Uh -huh. And they were forcing people off the land into the factories. And it's hard to imagine Japan being poor, because today the idea of Japan wanting to immigrate, they really don't, unless they marry. There's uh -huh. not a huge immigration. The Chinese and Indians love to come here. But in those days, Japan was, was poor. So the Japanese government kind of fostered the idea um, of immigration. And the idea was a permanent immigration or they, they were going to return? No, they all <laughs> thought after five or seven years they're going to go back to their hometown in Okayama or Kurume and buy land. And they just stayed longer and longer. Oh, yeah. And pretty soon they realized. And the white landowners, the, you know, the big five that had these plantations, um, all of a sudden realized they're going to have a problem because Although the Japanese Issei, the first generation, could never vote, all of their children could. And that's when they started realizing, boy, they got a, this, this problem. And they really didn't want Japanese to go beyond grammar school. You know, the next generation, keep them on the, um, on on the, the plantation. Yes. But the parents, of course, saw it totally different. And thank goodness, most of the teachers, the, the Holly teachers at the time, uh, were a lot different than the plantation owners, and they encouraged education. And by the 1930s, over 40 percent of the University of Hawaii, they're Japanese, uh -huh. Japanese Americans. But uh, Japanese. We'll, we'll we'll take a break and we'll yes, return okay. to your story in, a, in, a, in about a minute. Okay, right. Thank, Thank you. This is Think Tech Hawaii raising public awareness. Foundation for a better life. Hello, everyone.
everyone. I'm DeSoto Brown, the co-host of Human Humane Architecture, which is seen on Think Tech Hawaii every other Tuesday at 4 p.m. And with the show's host, Martin Despang, we discuss architecture here in the Hawaiian Islands and how it not only affects the way we live, but other aspects of our life, not only here in Hawaii, but internationally as well. So join us for Human Humane Architecture every other Tuesday at 4 p.m. on Think Tech Hawaii. Uh, I'm here again with uh, Mike Malahan, the author of Picture Bride, a novel, the epic story of Japanese in Hawaii. Okay, so your heroine has uh, arrived in Hawaii as a right. picture bride. That's correct. Where, where in Hawaii did she go? Well, you know, that's interesting. I had to choose what am I going to do with my picture bride. And most picture brides ended up in a plantation. And there's a very good book about that story, a, a, a movie about it. But then you're stuck with that plantation. And I wanted to let the reader see the entire perspective of the immigrant. So I had her marry a Buddhist priest. Now, she is educated. She's a strong woman. So if we've got, uh, you know, because I have a Japanese wife, and I always thought, you know, they're very compliant. Ho, ho, ho. But that's another story <laughs> for another day. Yeah. So Haro is a very strong uh, young, young teenager uh, lady. And there were young, strong strong people. But because as a wife of a priest, we can move her around. So I have her spend the first 10 years in Waimea, over in the Big Island, right next to the Parker Ranch. So we get to see the Parker Ranch with Japanese cowboys at the time. One of her other best friends is in the Kona Plantation. So we learn how coffee, the, the, why is Kona coffee Kona coffee? Why aren't the Filipinos or the Chinese doing it? Only the Japanese had the culture to make Kona coffee. And I try, I explain that to the eyes of another picture bride. Oh, that's fascinating. Yes, it is. So she's on the big island, and then how? Then well, something <coughs> happens, and uh, he gets called in during the sugar strike, and it's very ugly, and Haro uh, changes, turns her um, Buddhist uh, temple into a refugee camp. There's the uh, Spanish flu. People are dying. New marriages, you know, she dies, he dies. You've got to bring people together. And then the bishop says, I really need you to come over to the Big Island. And he then takes over the mission that's next to the university. So now we get to meet the university. But there, there's children growing up. Yeah. So about this time, we start to meet the children. And then we see the a big, uh, there's two parts of the story here that are very interesting. One is assimilation. How should the Japanese assimilate? And there's a lot of talk, could they assimilate? Could they not be? And you had, so again, so they really wanted to? That's the, that's the question. Yeah. Some really wanted to. Some wanted to retain their culture. The, uh, and they weren't allowed to become citizens, but the children could. The younger children grew up speaking Japanese, but the older children, I mean, the, the older children could speak Japanese. The younger ones couldn't. Sometimes the older children had to interpret for the younger children, talk to the parents. But the one story is the assimilation story and the prejudice and the, the way the military and people treated the Japanese. Mm -hmm. I have a reporter called Andy Pafko, and some of the things I have him say, people are going to say, that's horrible. How could Mike write about that? He didn't write about it. I copied it. No. Um, <clears throat> the other big story is the Massey trial. This is this girl. Yeah. yeah, that's a horrible thing. She accuses five brown people of raping her. Rape never happened. Right. But she came home with her tattered, tattered dress, and she had to give her husband a story, not realizing he would go to the police. They'd actually arrest people. There are people killed, uh, murdered. Um, Lawrence Darrell, the, the uh, famous attorney, comes out here for his last hurrah. And uh, it splits the, the community right down. The, the, the white, brown, Hawaiian, Japanese, it was just the ter terrible things to society. Um, they f eventually healed, it, but it, it was it very bad. It said that it postponed statehood for quite a long time. No? I'm sure it did. Yeah. It, it, the I, uh, I have a, a, a client who's a, a treasury agent who specializes in narcotics, mm. and uh, he has a good story about the Massey case. And, and uh, uh, he, his mentor, when he first came came here, right. told him that she was actually a drug addict and she was beaten up by her pusher. And uh, uh, to me, it sounds like a plausible. Yes, in, in the book I have it. She just had a dalliance. But yeah, there could be a drug. Yeah. She was definitely a goofy lady. Yeah. She was 19, 20 years old. Uh, her parents tried to have her move up and move an officer in the military, and yeah. she was a, a, a nutcase. Yeah. Eventually committed suicide. It's not in the book, because, you know, the book stops. Sure. Later on, she committed suicide. So uh, uh, your, your heroine comes 
to Honolulu? Or? Yeah, she, yeah, she'll come to Honolulu about 1921, 1922, yeah. uh, after ten, 10 years on the Big Island. Mm -hmm. And uh, then the rest of the time, we're going to watch her and the children see what's happening in Honolulu. I can see the Massey Trail the, and other types of things with the, with the children and what's going on in Hawaii at, at that time. And uh, always, most of the Japanese Issei, although they were always loyal to their, they brought their children up as Americans. And they and always told did them they America still go to first. Japanese school? Yeah, in fact, oh, I'm glad you brought that up. Yes, thank you. <laughs> uh, they had the, the extra school. They had the language schools. Yeah. And so the Japanese kids, after the regular school, then we'd go to their language school. And the language school taught them not just the Japanese language, but also the culture. And it bothered a lot of the Hollies, because you go into the school, and there'd be pictures of the Tenaheka, the emperor, and there'd be Admiral Togo, the, you know, the, the admiral who won the Russian war. Mm -hmm. And so people thought they would never assimilate and um, the Japanese were assimilating. Um, the same values that have make good citizens of Japan make good, good citizens anywhere. But I can see, and in the, in the book, I have a conflict where even Haro, the, our hero in here, mm -hmm. has an under empathy for the Holly's perspective. And she and her husband have some dilly-dallys arguments about his school, that there should be pictures of the American president up there. And there's a huge fight. I want to get into it, but one of more dramatic scenes is when she says, we can't keep doing this because look what the Hollies think of us. And we got our children to think about. But I can understand why some people would be anti-school. It had a lot to do with people not trusting the Japanese because of these um, schools. And as World War II approaches, uh, uh, what's going on there? I mean, <coughs> is she aware of that? that it's they are come? very much aware. You know, <clears throat> General George Patton, and we know, he was Colonel Patton. He came over to Japan, I mean, to Hawaii in the mid-30s, around 36 or 37. He wrote a whole thing about the so-called, what happens if there's a war with the orange country? And what do you do with the orange people? And his program, or what he said in 1936 and 37, was exactly what the FBI did in 1941. Round up the priest, round up the people. Everybody was very much aware of Patton's, the upper echelon. So they knew about Patton. And Harold learns about it also. So they were aware that there was going to be a war with Japan. And when there was going to be a war, the only question in Hawaii is how many people would be arrested. And so her son becomes the secretary of a group, and this is a real story, a group of people organized what is called the Morale Committee. And they wanted to counteract what is called the California disease. California was eager to put people in camps. Here, not so much. And they knew there was a war. And they did not want the Japanese community to be incarcerated in mass. And they weren't. How did they prevent that? Well, they prevented it very, very clever. But most important thing is they identified 2,000 people that were going to have to be the sacrificial lambs. The FBI never wanted to incarcerate people. Hoover was always against it. And so when the war broke out, the FBI, within uh, a day or two, Rested almost 1,000. Later, it would be 2,000. Priests, business people, journalists, and so forth. They hadn't done anything. But by arresting them, the FBI locally here could say, we've solved the problem. Economically, the Japanese were very important here. The military said, are we going to take 140,000 people? I'm fighting a war. Where am I going to find ships and military to build up whole new cities? And and a famous scene in the book is the Admiral Nimitz goes out there and he shows the FBI guy, take a look at my ships that are being resuscitated from the attack the Japanese do. And there's, doing it. <laughs> there's Japanese welders and Japanese longshoremen. They're not all of them. He says, you, you take these people away, how am I going to get my ships back up out of the water? So you had the local military, much different than this General DeWitt in, in California, who was eager to put those people in camps. He didn't think any Japanese could be trusted. Here you had a totally different society. You never had, uh, you know, people got along with each other. Even though there was a Caucasian community that, community that was on top, the antipathy, the, the, the feeling of treating people bad was nothing like it was in, in, the, in the States. And even today, you know, we talk about Hawaii today. It's much different than Hawaii then. There definitely was prejudice and there were definitely them and us but it wasn't with the same daily vitriol that you saw among the races in uh, and, the and state. How did your heron and, and her family deal with the, that period, in the, the beginning of the war, 
but with Pearl Harbor itself. Well, yeah. that's in the second book. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but well, give us a preview. Well, I, I tell you, the, one of the most famous things in the second book is that when the war first breaks out, they take the ROTC unit, and the ROTC then starts guarding the different installations, telephone utilities. Most of the ROTC were Japanese Americans, and so they're guarding. In the meantime, these generals are coming over from the West Coast, so you know, the joke is, gee, did we lose the war? Har, 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 because all these Japanese guys with guns. So there's a famous scene that's in the book. It's, it's riveting. They, they take all the Hawaiian Japanese, there's about a couple hundred of them, and they take them to a school at, early in the morning, and they're thinking they're going to get an award. You know, they've been digging ditches. They've been putting barbed wire. They've been actually kibitzing with the governor because they're at... Washington House, they got a little tent at Washington House, and instead they said, guys, turn in your guns, you're out. Take off your uniform. You go home, turn on your uniforms, you're not in anymore. And some of the guys were pretty upset. There's a Chinese man, very famous guy, Hung Wai Ching, and he uh, talks to the boys outside because he knows this is happening. He says, what are you guys going to do? You're mad. And some of them signed up, it was called the Varsity Victory Volunteers. And they signed a petition to the military governor. He says, we will do anything. Give us a, 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 you know, something to dig a ditch. We will do that. And they did. There's about 100 of them that signed up. They got military uniforms, a small salary, lived at Schofield Air Books, Airfield, you know, Schofield Barracks. And they helped build roads and things like that. And as a consequence of that, eventually, Roosevelt had second thoughts, and they said, you know, maybe we should let these guys um, fight for America. And that's just, that's the next book. That's the next book, you know, how they so fight how, for America. So how do you feel the book is done here in Hawaii? You know, it's been out a little while now. Yeah, you know, but, like, no matter how, how well you did, I, I wish you had done better. It's in all the bookstores. Mm -hmm. um, I love getting the reviews. And once in a while, I get a note from somebody who, you know, had an uncle or somebody, and they know their story about their grandmother and so forth. So uh, it's been very, uh, very satisfactory uh, for me. Has it made friends for you? Uh, it, it, it's made a lot of friends. I, I mentioned one of the, my, the veterans who passed away. He was a uh, artillery spotter. In fact, in the second book, I have him as one of my main characters because artillery spotters go anywhere in the battlefield where a rifleman, he's kind of right. stuck. So uh, the same idea. I want to have a movie around. But in his real life, a guy was Katz Miho. And he and I would meet often talk about his days in the military. He could relive those days. And we've got so close, when I had my 20th wedding anniversary um, some years ago, 30th now, uh, he officiated at the uh, renewal of the vows. Is this the famous Tats? Tats, well, I don't know if he's famous or not. Yeah. To me, he was famous. Yeah. And, uh, but he was friends of Senator Inouye. I remember Senator Inouye visited him at the hospital, which I thought was very nice of the senator. He's a busy mm -hmm. guy, dropped by and talk to him for 30 minutes because he's one of the old the old gang, the old yeah. guys that, you know, from those days. But yeah, I've met a lot of, uh, as a consequence of writing the book, I've met a lot of uh, interesting um, people. One of them was you, you know, you, well, <laughs> uh, the well, first book, yeah. Uh, Mike, uh, uh, all best wishes for this book. And, well, thank and you. And I'm really looking forward to the next well, volume. Not as much as me. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Roger. Uh, and thank you, everybody, for tuning in today.